We have some announcements this morning. Before we get started, I just want to say thank you for everyone that came out yesterday to our highway ministry outreach. Uh, we gave out, I think it was 50 flyers and we ran out of flyers and we just started passing out cards. So um, we pray that God will bless that. We also have the ladies Bible study this September the 23rd at 12 p.m. That's coming up this week. Fall Festival, September the 30th from 10 to 4. Come out and see us in Rogersville. Now, are we supposed to be there early? Or does it, we get there at 10? Okay. Uh, yard sale, Saturday, October the 7th at 7 a.m. Spread the word. Let everybody know we're going to be here. And that's all of our announcements. You have your Bibles this morning. Let's turn to First Corinthians chapter nine. Verse twenty four and twenty five. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, they all run. But one receiveth the prize. So Paul goes on and he says, So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I want to talk to us for a little while today on this thought. It's not how you come out of the gate, but it's how you cross the finish line. Yesterday, when we, you can be seated this morning, yesterday when we started our outreach, when we came out of the gate, it didn't look very good. It was kind of dreary, it looked like it was going to rain a little bit. Uh, there wasn't even any cars coming for a little while. We, was, we didn't look very good coming out of the gate but we went across the finish line strong. And it's not how you come out of the gate, but it's how you cross the finish line. I got this thought, and this thought will probably turn into a two-part lesson, but I got this thought the other day at the restaurant when I was eating lunch on my lunch break, and the restaurant where we was at had TVs around on the walls and on one of the TVs they had the horse races on and the riders and the trainers would take these horses and they would get them to the starting gate and get them in their chutes and get everybody lined up and ready and the bell would ring and the gates would swing open and off they'd go tearing down the track racing for that corruptible prize running for the crown of Kentucky Derby or whatever race, the name of the race that they were racing for. The corruptible trophy for the trainer, the wreath of flowers that would soon wither and fade away that they would adorn the horse with in the winter circle and the prize money and the title for the owners of the horse and the jockey, of course, racing for his commission and, and prize of the race. The first part of the track was a straight run down a designated length before the turn, and it, it varies depending on what race they were in. And I noticed as they tore out of the gate that there was always that one horse that would just jump right out ahead of all the others. Sometimes he would have a nice gap between him and the trailing horses the other riders and the competitors. And as they went down the track into the first turn, this lead horse would still be in a very noticeable lead. As it came out of that turn and, ran, and, and hit the next straight run of the track, it would hold that position and sometimes it would even gain distance between it and the rest of the pack. The second turn would come and by this point, 
the horses are sweating. You can see the sweat glistening off of them and, and their nostrils are flaring to take in air to keep running the race. As, and they're trying to take in as much air as they can. And this lead horse would still be well out ahead of the rest of the pack with what looked like a definite win and a sure victory in spot in the winner's circle. Like he already had it in the saddlebags, if you will. But coming out of the second turn and entering into the home stretch, this lead horse would begin to slow its pace. On the last stretch of the race, it would begin to slowly lose the momentum and the lead that it held the whole race. And that lead would begin to diminish. And a horse from somewhere in the trailing pack would from out of the dust and clods of dirt that had been thrown in its face the whole race would begin to make its move. The finish line was only just ahead. But now the horse that's held the lead finds itself neck and neck with another horse that has come up beside him and the finish line is growing closer with every stride. And in the last few feet of the race, the horse that held the lead for 80 or 90% of the race would fall behind as another horse passed. One from somewhere in the back of the pack that ate the dust and had the dirt clods bounce off of its face the entire race with grit in its eyes, dust in its lungs, it now takes the lead going on to cross the finish line Claiming the win. See, it didn't matter that for the majority of the race it was behind. When the, when the gate swung open and they all tore down the track, it didn't matter that all the others jumped ahead and took the lead. It didn't matter that the horse that held the lead, the majority of the race, took that lead from the moment that it came out of the gate. It didn't matter that for 75% of the track, it led by four or five lengths. They didn't win from how long they were in the lead. They didn't win from holding the lead spot the longest amount of time in the duration of the race. See, it wasn't how they came out of the gate but it was how they crossed the finish line. 1 Corinthians 9 and 24, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. It amazes me the efforts and the energies that people will put into things. Races if you will allow me to use the term in a broad sense today, sports stars and athletes who play with broken bones, torn ligaments, strained muscles, all to obtain a crown of Super Bowl champion, to get their names in the halls of fame, for Heisman trophies and for hitters who who strive for home run king or slugger of the year. Pitchers who will throw their shoulders and their elbows out of socket. All for the title of, he's a no-hit pitcher. He's strikeout king. Rodeo and bull, bronc, bull and bronc riders risk limb and even life to climb on the back of a beast, hold on to a rawhide string, and attempt to hold on for eight seconds through the jar and whiplash of that eight seconds under the scrutiny 
of judges watching for the flash and skill of their ride and how hard and how difficult the bull or bronc made it to stay on to give them a score. All for the title of PBR champion. I don't know if some of these terms were correct today. I'm not a sportsman. I know just the minimum about such things. But hopefully my point is clear. These people will strive for the mastery of whatever it is they're doing to obtain corruptible crowns. But when it comes to being a Christian, when it comes to living for God, that's not the case most of the time. We won't go to bat for God. And I'm not talking about playing baseball and throwing a little something about God in the, in the day of playing. But I'm talking about stepping up to the plate to face what the world throws at you for your faith. We won't saddle up for Jesus. And I'm not talking about church in the dirt and riding bulls and broncs and throwing a prayer and a hymn in the mix and talking about God for a few minutes be between events. I'm talking about what David said in Psalm 22, 12 through 22. I know it's a, a lengthy read, but David said in verse 12, Many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and a roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws, and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me, they pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. David said, all this is going on. The bulls have tried to take me out. He said, I've poured out of myself like water. My bones are out of joint. My tongue is stuck to my jaws. I can't even speak right anymore. I've been in the dust of death. They've pierced my hands and my feet. You can, you can even see my bones. They've stripped me of my flesh. But he said, hold on just a minute. I'm still running that I may obtain the prize. Philippians verse, chapter 3, verse 13 and 14 says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind, I keep reaching forth unto those things which are before. He said, I press, I keep pressing toward the mark for the prize, the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I'm striving for the mastery. There is a crown incorruptible. Peter wrote of that crown in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 4. He said, When the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that don't fade, that fadeth not away. Paul said in 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8, he said, I'm now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I fought a good fight, I have finished my course. And I've kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. 
and not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. The bulls have gaped upon me with their mouths like ravening lions. The dogs have compassed me, but I'm still fighting, Lord. I'm still striving. I'm still running with the message. David continued in verse 19 of Psalm 22. But be not thou far from me, O Lord, my strength. Haste thee to help me. He said, help me, Lord. I'm still striving. I'm still in this. Just help me. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorns. David said, all this has befallen me, yet, verse 22, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. See, it didn't matter to David that the bulls were after him. It didn't matter that the dogs was nipping at his heels. He said, I will still declare truth. I will still declare thy name and I will praise you no matter what. See, we won't pour out of ourselves and risk life and limb and strive to obtain the incorruptible crown. My mom shared a video and I'm going to talk a little bit about it. It was a video of Christians in China and the persecution that they endure. In this video, it talked about how they have Bible study or church, whatever you want to call it, for eight hours at a time, nonstop. I've been places and preached where if I preached over 30 minutes, they started looking at the wall up at the clock behind on the back wall. And one man even got up and took it down while I was preaching. But they listen for eight hours at a time. They gather underground or in secret places because if they get caught in church, if you will, they go to prison for three years. We have freedom to gather and worship God and many Christians today haven't even been to church in three years. Much less get cast into prison for three years for going to church. See, we, we come out of the gate good. We come out strong. But it's not how you come out of the gate. It's how you cross the finish line. And I'm going to tell you, the persecution that they're enduring, they may not be looking good coming out of the gate, but when they cross the finish line, when they cross the finish line, that's what's going to matter. They will travel for three hours just to get to one of these places to have church. And if we have to drive more than 30 minutes down the road, we won't go. They don't have but maybe one Bible per family. But we average two Bibles per person of the family. I know I've got two or three. And when this missionary from America went there, he took Bibles with him and he passed them out among the group, as many as he had. He didn't have enough for everyone. And he gave the book, the chapter, verse he was going to take his text from. And he noticed that one lady that he that had received a Bible, when she opened the Bible and looked and seen where he was reading from, she just passed it to the one beside her that didn't have a Bible. And then he noticed that this lady recited the whole chapter from memory. And he asked her about it and she told him, you have a lot of time in prison. So while they're in prison, they memorize scripture. And he said, but wouldn't they confiscate your Bible in prison? She said, oh yeah, they, they do. He said, well, how do you learn? He said, he said how, you don't have a Bible to read from. She said, when friends or family come to visit, they bring chapters of the Bible written on pieces of paper 
and they slip them to us. And he said, well, wouldn't they find those pieces of paper and confiscate those? She said, oh yeah, that's why we memorize it as quickly as possible. Because even though, she said, even though they can throw us in prison, even though they can confiscate our Bibles, even though they might even take away the pieces of paper that we get, they can't take what's in our heart. David said, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And before the missionary left this group, they asked him to pray for them. And he said, what, what do you want me to pray for specifically? And they said that we can have church like you do in America. And he said, I'm sorry, but I'm not going to pray that. He said, all these things that I just mentioned, how they travel for hours, they sit on rock floors. In, in the story, they would sit in the dirt, real church in the dirt, for eight hours at a time. He said, you people don't even get to own a Bible but yet you've memorized more of it than Americans have with an average of two Bibles per person per home. He said, I'm sorry, but I will not pray that y'all can be like us, but I will, however, pray that we could be more like you. See, it's not how we come out of the gate. Folks, it's how we go across the finish line. And as I watched the horse races, my dad was with me and we, we both noticed that the horses that would usually uh, the fastest out of the gate, that jumped ahead before everybody else, before all the others, it was usually not that horse that took the lead early in the race, but it was the one, the one that won started from somewhere in the back. And then we noticed something else about that particular horse. It always seemed like that horse was really wanting to run. But it was like something was holding him back. Something like he really wanted to go and, and get up there with the rest of them. But the jockey or the rider was holding him back. The one with the reins didn't let him go all out. Down the track into the first turn, just a light run. The same through the rest of the race. Till that last turn. And while the lead horse and the other horses in the race had given it all they had to this point and had entered into the last portion of the race, drained of energy, muscles fatigued, lungs gasping for air, and losing momentum with every stride, the horse that was held back the whole race until this final stretch has the energy to pull ahead. It's not fatigued and drained. It's not out of wind and gasping for air like the other horses. And so it passed all of them to win, to take the lead, win the race, and claim the prize. See, it's not how you come out of the gate but it's how you go across the finish line. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 11. Solomon the preacher writes and says, I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance happeneth to them all. I want to tell somebody today, and I'm speaking to myself when I say this too, because sometimes I feel like this. 
but we may feel like God is holding us back. Psalm 139 and 13, For thou hast possessed my reins. See, he has the reins, folks. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. He's had the reins from before you were born. And Psalm 26 and verse 2 says, Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my reins and my heart. See, we want to run. I'm reminded of a story in the Bible in 2 Samuel. Joab and the men of David were in battle. And they were in a battle with the king's son, Absalom. And in, in this story, it talks about how the woods that day, the, the forest, the woods claimed more lives than was actually took in battle from the soldiers. And Absalom was killed. And one of Joab's men said, let me run. Let me run to the king and, and bring tidings. And Joab said, you're, you're not going to run. You, you, you don't, you're not going to bring tidings today. But then another man by the name of Cushai, Joab sent him and said, run to the king and bring him tidings. So Cushai starts running. And the whole time, I believe the name of the other man was Ahimeaz. He's telling Joab, let me run. So finally Joab said, okay, Ahimeaz, go ahead and run. You want to run? Go ahead and run. And it says that Ahimeaz took the way of the plain and over, overcame Cushai and beat him to David. And David said, what's the tidings? And, and Cush, uh, Ahimeaz said, your enemies are slain, O king. And the king said, but what about Absalom? What about my son? See, they, they were in war with Absalom, the king's son. And Ahimeaz didn't have an answer. He didn't know that Absalom had been slain. But then they looked, and there was another runner coming. And when he got there, the king said, what's the tidings? And he gave the same report. And the king said, what about Absalom? What about my son? And Cushai had the answer. See, it's not how you come out of the gate, but it's how you cross the finish line. Even though Ahimeaz beat him there, he didn't have the message. He didn't have the answer. He didn't have the truth. He didn't have the message that was wanted and needed. So that's why it's not how you come out of the gate, but it's how you cross the finish line. See, we want to run. We want to sing a certain way. We want to witness in this manner. We want to preach like this person or in this kind of way. And we want to give Bible studies like so and so. And we want to do all these different things. We, we want to run. But sometimes it feels like the reins are being pulled and we're just held back. I want to tell us today that the Lord has the reins. And He's holding us back for the final stretch. Because it's not how we come out of the gate, but it's how we go across the finish line. Oh, He could let us fly out full speed. But just like the horse, we would lose steam and run out of drive and run out of energy on the final stretch of the of the competition. He knows the battle's not to the strong. He could let us go out sword glistening and spear jabbing, but we would lose the fight because we would be as one that beat the air. But what does the rest of the verse say that I read earlier, Ecclesiastes 3 and 11? Time and chance happeneth to them all. He's holding back the reins 
till the perfect time. Ecclesiastes 3 and 1. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. And many of us know the next few verses, how they talk about there's a time to, uh, a time to plant, a time to pluck up what's planted, a time to uh, gather stones together and cast away stones, all the different things. But then in verse 11, He hath made everything beautiful in His time. In His time. When His time comes, for you to shine, He'll turn the reins loose and let you run. And then that's the chance that happens. So that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. It's not how we come out of the gate, but it's how we go across the finish line. But it goes without saying, if we never come out of the gate, we won't ever cross the finish line. And as I come to a close today, if the praise team wants to come, they can. I want us to just take a minute and pray. It doesn't matter if we feel like we're on the final stretch and the finish line is just ahead. Or maybe we have our position somewhere in the middle of the race. Somewhere in the middle of the journey. Or maybe we've come out of the gate and we're just running and waiting on the Lord to give the command that we be loosed. Or maybe we've just come out of the gate this morning we don't even really know what the next step may be. I want to tell us today that the Lord wants everyone to cross the finish line. Just keep running the race. Just keep fighting the good fight. 1 Timothy 6 and 12, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and has professed a good profession before many witnesses.